Good afternoon or evening, depending on what side of the pod you're on, and welcome to an extra special episode of Across the Pitch. My name is Phil Kennedy, and today I'm joined by Tony Robinson, not for an Accrington Stanley interview, but for a question and answer session. Now, uh, uh, you might know Tony from our Accrington Stanley interviews, What you might not know uh, is that back in September of 2019 was Tony's first appearance in episode 58, where we kind of chatted and and got to know Tony a bit. So if you haven't listened to that one, uh, definitely make sure that you go back and and check that out, because it's uh, a great introduction to to someone who uh, basically after that episode, uh, you know, kind of went from guests to uh, to co-host with us. And since then, uh, not only has Tony uh, joined just about all of the Accrington Stanley interviews that we've done uh, with the current players with uh, an absolute unmatched level of research, he's also come up with what has become our most popular segment on the show, which is called Rapid Fire. Uh, and today, Tony uh, has been brought in to do an extended version of his own segment that he created. <laughs> so welcome uh, to the show, Tony. I, I don't know if you're you're a guest or a host or kind of both today, but uh, I'm, great great to be with you here today. Thanks, Phil. I'm not sure what to say after that. I don't know. Uh, I I don't know if I'm a player, a coach, or just a guest or uh, a co-host, but. Uh, I'll, I've got many hats here, so we'll just uh, keep uh, trying on a different hat as the as we go along. But uh, just to comment, I didn't realize it was back in episode fifty eight. That shows how much uh, how much work you've done, Phil, and how long how far the uh, the broadcasts have come to uh, to talk I, to to be a guest on fifty eight. And I guess being um, the point where I kept uh, uh, pushing and pushing and and contacting and talking about it that I thought I think you thought the best way to uh, to keep me uh, quiet was to get me on the show. <laughs> well, well, it couldn't be further from that. <laughs> it it, it uh, this episode here will actually end up being, I believe, number one twenty nine. So this will be uh, uh, seventy one episodes out from your first appearance and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think what happened is when he came on the show that day, and just to give folks uh, a little bit of history, I, I think that Tony is really one of our original listeners and original readers. And going back to our days of the show and, and just thinking of uh, looking at uh, like Google or our, our stats on our podcast distribution, uh, you know, in any time we ever would put out a podcast or an article, one of the very first things that would pop up would be in Ontario, Canada. And I mean, Tony has avidly listened to and read uh, just about everything that we've put out since day one. Uh, and then he came on in episode 58, and, and you know, I really enjoyed that chat with him. Uh, and, and some of you may not know that, uh, that Tony uh, actually was a hockey coach as well in Canada, very accomplished at that. Uh, and we actually recorded a couple episodes of a hockey show. I uh, just kind of ended up where doing more than one podcast at a time was uh, a little bit more than we could chew off. So we we kind of mothballed the hockey show. Uh, and I said, well, hey, Tony, we're about to start doing all these uh, current player interviews with Accrington Stanley. I uh, mean, that you lived there. You traveled to the games. You were born there. You lived on Stanley Street. Uh, I can't think of anybody better to uh, get on the team, and the the rest has kind of been history since then. Well, you know, when I first saw uh, things crop up, and I don't know, uh, I don't know if it was on Facebook or what cropped up, but I did see when you were doing the uh, interview with uh, Scott Brown. And uh, and I was I was very surprised to see that was there was somebody in uh, not only North America but in Phoenix 
uh, talking about Accrington Stanley because I, I think, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, being being an Accrington Stanley supporter in North America, um, I thought was a very lonely sort of uh, 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 hobby or occupation. And uh, so when I found somebody else talking about Stanley, I mean, I, I was all over that like a new suit of clothes, you know, and uh, just so somebody else that, uh, was talking about it. And I thought, well, you know, if these guys, uh, if there's anything they need from a North American's perspective to fill in gaps or answer questions, then, and that's why I kind of sort of got involved is to sort of, uh, you know, try and uh, discuss and help people get more informed about Stanley. Well, I think that it's really just, it's worked out so well. And to be able to kind of be the, the North American voice of Stanley and uh, also with the North American Stanley Supporters Club, where uh, you know, you're know you heading up the Canadian end of things and I'm heading up the U.S. end of things. And, you know, just to, to kind of be telling the story of Stanley uh, and, you know, to to have John Coleman or a number of players come on the show and, and say that they listen to us. It's just the ultimate compliment. Well, I, yeah. And, and I, I mean, it's been, it's been a thrill when you hear people, uh, you know, comment about uh, a previous episode or, and as like John Coleman did was uh, he pointed out that I had missed a, co- a question on the rapid fire. I, I mean, that's uh, it, it's, it's good to see that people, uh, you know, in and around uh, Stanley and other places, appreciate uh, you know the the effort and the work, and and obviously the, under your uh, guidance and leadership, we uh, we get this uh, done. And and uh, you know, I mean, I, as you know, I I love talking uh, football, and uh, and the fact that I'm from Accrington, uh, just you know, I mean, it's a it's a fit where I just I I, I don't think there was any doubt or any question that I would support Accrington Stanley. And I just feel uh, that when I was growing up, I missed, and there's a generation out there in the 60s, 70s that probably missed out of uh, following Stanley as their first team. And uh, But there is a lot more now that have Stanley, uh, obviously, as their first team. And there's a, a generation that has two teams. And and, and fortunately, uh, hopefully, it's, uh, it's Stanley. And I think uh, there's a lot of those people coming back to the club and thinking, you know, this these this is pretty good setup and uh, a nice place to go, and uh, and, and and you know, when if we can bring more of those people back, then and like uh, like as was said on one episode, is that we're documenting uh, Stanley for history. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's a pretty good feeling. It, it really is. Uh, I mean, it, it just blows me away because, like I said, going back to you know when we started the show. Uh, like uh, some of the stories I was telling the other day when I I first told uh, told Aaron that I wanted to make a podcast about Accrington Stanley, he, <laughs> he didn't even think I was serious for two months, and then uh, I I reached out to Scott Brown, and I didn't think there there was any way in the world that he was even going to answer my message, and you know I I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, I was I was laying in bed, uh, and it was like five in the morning, uh, and I you know, whatever reason, I, I rolled over and, and looked at my phone and I saw uh, that I had a message and I, I just kind of clicked on it to see what it was. I had it said, new message from Scott Brown. Well, I will tell you, I never woke up at five <laughs> in the morning faster than, than that. I was like, is that, I mean, it was maybe, you know, 8 p.m. our time the, the previous night I had sent the message. So this is the very next morning. And then yeah. so I, and then he's like, yeah, you know, how, how about we come on tomorrow? And then so, you know, it, it maybe was till about 7 a.m. that I could actually wait to tell Aaron about it. Uh, and then so about 7 a.m. on Saturday morning, I'm messaging uh, Aaron. I'm like, Aaron, wake up. We're interviewing <laughs> Scott Brown tomorrow. And he's like, what? <laughs> well, I and you know that that interview, that contact uh, with Scott Brown. Uh, when you look at it, how many doors has that opened for uh, all the other interviews? And I, you know, as a possibility, without that interview of Scott Brown, uh, the others wouldn't come into play. I think I think it's uh, it, it's uh, like you said, he's been a great guest, and uh, and the. Uh, you know, we owe a big thanks to Scott Brown for, uh, you know, for laying the foundation to get uh, get the Stanley interviews. 
Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of other people involved, but I think Scott was the one that kickstarted it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if Scott hadn't taken the chance to come on to a show that was two days old at that <laughs> point, yeah, we would not exist today. And it, it was just, you know, it, it was one of those things where everything just kind of worked out. It, it, it was like out, out of all of the teams that, that there are in England, I really could have picked any team. And, you know, I just happened to, you know, Accrington Stanley seemed to be the team that, that caught my attention that I wanted to learn more about. And then, uh, you know, like I said, I, I started playing the FIFA game just to find out who the players were. And, and Scott Brown was one of the few guys that the announcer said who it was when he got the ball. And, and that's kind of how he became my favorite player and uh, why I decided to reach out to him. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. No. And I, I, you know, I think that with Accrington Stanley, there's a lot of different things that, you know, in my opinion, come into play as to why it resonates with a lot of people. Uh, I mean, the name is very unique, uh, Stanley, uh, and the fact that it went out of business and it, and it was uh, reformed. And uh, the, as I say, the reference to Phoenix, to your rising, this is a, is a Stanley rolls again in 68. And, uh, you know, there's um, just uh, and the milk advert, they have the milk commercial. Uh, there's a lot of things that come into play that people have sort of a uh, a soft spot uh, to Stanley, and and as we've seen from guests that we've had on the show, that when they they make a uh, a, a trip to the stadium uh, and and go through that experience, a match day experience, uh, and get to talk to people, it, they they it's like a bug. They get the the they, they get bitten, and then they kind of get hooked on it, you know. And it, it only takes in some cases one visit, and then they say, you know, it's just. This is uh, this is like a nice pair of slippers. It fits and it makes me feel comfortable, you know. Well, well, absolutely. Everything you said is just spot on, and uh, and of course you mentioned the milk advert, and I think you know obviously I mentioned a hundred thousand times that that was the the original way that I heard of Stanley, and and I think you know that kind of goes back to the the heart of what motivated me to want to pick Stanley to be the team that, that we covered and, and really told the story of it. It's like I said, so it, it all started out with a, a question on the Total Soccer Show, like I, I told Daryl Grove when he was on, and the question was, why is Accrington Stanley funny? I, and then when, when Aaron was telling the story, about uh, you know how he was first moved to England from Australia and thought a, a team from a comic strip was yeah. uh, a real team, and and then they told him, well, you may as well just root for Accrington Stanley, and then uh, even like I said, you know, for for two months when I told him we were going to make a podcast about Accrington Stanley, it, he thought it was a joke, but then it, it was when I. I went and I started reading, like you said, that the story of how the team went out of business and reformed and the team that wouldn't die and the, the four promotions and being part of the original football league and just even that the history of the town, like the, uh, you know, with the, the brick making and the, the Empire State Building. And I, I just said, yeah. well, this isn't funny. This is this is incredible. And, and I wanted to be able to hopefully make it to a point where Accrington Stanley would be known for their football and their history and not be the butt of the joke anymore. I mean, that that was kind of what motivated me to want to tell the story of Stanley. Yeah, and I, uh, that uh, milk uh, advert they did, obviously, many, many years ago. And then they did, uh, I think it was the sto studio uh, co.uk did a second one uh, and they actually got in rushing it and 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 I think I didn't get as much play as the first but it's really really good because at the end where in rush comes on and said <laughs> well you know they're they're not that bad actually because I couldn't Stanley or lean league one now so I think that was a, a, a nice way to sort of uh, close the gap I wish it had got more airplay but uh, it just goes to show you that you know, um, it's like the little, little engine that could is what, and is what has happened to Stanley. And I watched, um, 
uh, last weekend, I did watch the Sundown Till I Die uh, uh, series. And and you look at that team being in, in League One and the amount of staff and the budget and the money, uh, the crowds they have, uh, and 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 yet you go on uh, and and you got Stanley at the other end of the spectrum, and they they're competing on the same uh, level playing field uh, as uh, as Zacherton and, and Stanley. Are, I mean, they're both playing on the you know playing in the same League One and and, and being competitive. So I I think this it just it goes to show you how big of an accomplishment it is when you watch a series like Sunderland Until I Die. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it was Sunderland. I mean, this is a club. I, I actually uh, read a, a stat the other day is that four times Sunderland set the what was at the time the record for the largest sighting in European history. Now, I mean, most of these were 80, 100 years yeah. ago, but it, it just shows how long and, and how big of a club Sunderland has been. Meanwhile, with Accrington, you're telling me what was it twelve years ago when when you were buying a shirt directly from the chairman? Yeah, when uh, yeah, I think uh, probably I know it was before it, they were back in the football league, and uh, uh, I think the uh, sponsor of the of the club at the time was Heinburn uh, Borough Council, so it was a local uh, council that was sponsoring the team, and you, uh, you knocked on the door. And because uh, and uh, on this little porta cabinet, and uh, Eric Wally answered, and I said, I'd "Like to buy a shirt?" And uh, and there we went, you know. And uh, uh, compared to that, to what uh, when you look at the at the uh, at that Sunderland, and they've got numerous people just in the ticket office, and umpteen chefs, and uh, the facilities, you know, and 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 they're underachieving. And then you look at Stanley, and I don't so I say overachieving, but they're you know, for for the size of the club, they get uh, they get uh, everything out of uh, the the coaching staff, the the support staff, uh, the groundskeeper, everybody. They get every everybody uh, really does more as far as carry their weight than than a lot of other uh, places like Sunderland. Maybe Sunderland might have a staff of forty. Stanley might have a staff of eight, and they're doing just as good a job, if not better, than what the people at Sunderland do. So was that the only time that you considered that uh, uh, you were purchasing a shirt and you considered uh, having the person that, that was selling you the shirt sign it while he was at it? <laughs> I, you know, I never even thought about because uh, my mom was with me at the time and uh, she actually uh, said she knew Eric from some connection from when we lived in the town. And uh, I, I remember uh, I bought a home and away a shirt. And uh, I did. I just I went to pay for it with a credit card, like as we do in North America. And he said, "Oh no, we don't. We don't take credit cards. It's just cash." So uh, my mom had to spot me some money that day to pay for the shirts, and then I had to I had to pay her back. But uh, I thought it was uh, it was comical. But and then I always said, I remember saying, if once uh, I think I might have mentioned it to him then at the time that if you ever get back in the football league. I'll fly over uh, to watch that match. And that was my first, believe it or not, uh, that would be 2006. That was my first ever Accrington Stanley match live was their first home match against Darlington in August of 2006. But I made a point of, of, of flying over to, to see it. And, and, and I think I look back now and say, gee, that was my first match of, of, of seeing Accrington Stanley yet being a supporter since, you know, from as long as you know. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, quite a uh, a journey that it's been since 2006, because, you know, of course, that's when they, they got promoted to the Football League, and, uh, you know, the rest of it is history to, uh, you know, where we're at now. Uh, but what we uh, what we started off with today is, so there there's basically two reasons that, that we made this episode. One uh, is that, that Tony invented rapid fire, and based on his kind of banter with the guests, you may have an idea of what his answers are, but he's never actually done the rapid fire himself. Uh, so we, we definitely need to have Tony do rapid fire. So that's what we're going to do next. Okay. And then the, uh, 
the other thing is is so the uh, the other day uh, I had posted out on Twitter oh, that you know the players make some mistakes on the pitch. We're going to make mistakes on the. Sorry about that. Oh no problem. I hit I hit I lent on my iPad. It started playing one of your episodes. <laughs> See, I I told you this man listens to the show a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm listening to the show while I'm uh, recording the show. That's good. <laughs> well, the uh, the the other reason that uh, that we were uh, uh, recording this particular episode is because the other day we had put out a uh, a post on Twitter uh, where we were hoping to get some U.S. based football questions, uh, and we actually ended up getting. Probably about three different shows worth of questions from Gary and Lancashire. And many of these questions are, uh, you know, kind of a parallel question to Tony's rapid fire. So I, I've thought that, that there definitely would not be anyone better than Tony to, to join me and, and answer some of these questions. There, there's some good ones on here. But but before we get to Gary's questions, we're going to cue the sound effect. And Tony, are you ready to be the guest for Rapid Fire today? Give it to me, Phil. Okay, so your first question that you ever came up with was at the... Uh, Mushy peas or garden peas, right? Yeah, m- mushy all day long. Okay, and so as an American, I honestly don't even know where I would purchase mushy peas. So my question is, are mushy peas actually a different kind of peas, or are they just cooked over a lot until they get mushy? Well, um, you can buy uh, uh, cans of them. I think they're in some international stores. I think their bachelors make them is the name. But it used to be, and a, 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 maybe people could correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I remember my mother used to buy, I think they were Marifat peas, and she used to have a little salt tablet, and she used to soak them overnight, and then you'd boil them the next day, and you just boil them until they become uh, very, very uh, thick, almost a thick pea soup kind of thing, you know. So, uh, and, and I mean, they just, uh, they're... Um, they just, I mean, absolutely fantastic with fish and chips and meat and potato pie, chips and peas. I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's one of the staples. When you go back to England, there's nothing like mushy peas from a chippy. Nothing like it. So would you say it's similar to like refried beans? I guess it could be a, if it could be a similar version. Uh, there, it's, it's, it's like when you get a, a, it's, you get a spoon and you just dollop them on your plate. Generally, they're, uh, they're, uh, you know, like a, a, a paste with a green thick paste, you know, kind of thing. So I don't know. I just, I, I just like the taste where garden peas are just, you know, they're just up, off doing their own thing. Mushy peas are, uh, are just something that goes really well with uh, fish and chips. Well, I'm, I'm not a fish guy, but I'll, I'll try the peas at some point. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, uh, as I say, it's, uh, they always have, you go in any chippy and, uh, and order fish and chips. Uh, they always have a pot of peas uh, uh, on the stove, uh, just uh, bubbling away. So, the, uh, yeah, it's everybody. Uh, everybody will uh, eat mushy peas at some point. I wonder why they don't have them at Long John Silver's. Yeah, I don't know why it's not. But it's, it just doesn't. I don't know if um, I don't know why it wouldn't take off here. But I just don't. You just don't see. I mean, my wife buys them in the cans, and we have them. You know, if we have meat potato pie. Uh, she'll open a can of those, and uh, so we have them quite a bit uh, while we're here. But it's just not the same as getting them at a at a chippy. All right. Well, then the next one is red sauce or brown sauce on your bacon buddy. Oh, brown has to be HP. Okay, and then so now uh, for American listeners, this would be similar to like a, an A one sauce, right? Yeah, it's HP is it's uh, it's got the picture of the House of Parliaments on the uh, on the on the bottle, and Big uh, ben, right? Yeah, and so it's got it has H, and I think that's where the HP comes from, House of the Parliament. But uh, yeah, you can have it. I think in in fact on the bottle it will say that uh, it's kind of like a steak sauce, but it's just got a nice flavor. And yeah, definitely have it on uh, uh, on uh, on your bacon, uh, but a bacon butty. 
Now, another thing I do too is when I do a bacon, like on a, a big bun or a big barm cake, like a big a brown hamburger bun or something of that nature, I put on what they call Branston pickle, which is a, is a, a relish, but it's a dark pickled relish. And that, that, is, uh, that is really good uh, with, uh, on a bacon sandwich. Well, I'll take your word for that because I'm not <laughs> not a not a pickle guy whatsoever. But so so going back to the brown sauce, I'm glad you mentioned that the Houses of Parliament, and I was kind of surprised that that Northerners would, would have a sauce that has big band and things from London pictured on it. And I, I thought back to how how when I as a kid. Uh, my dad only drank Coors, and if somebody handed him a bottle of Budweiser. He would peel off the label so that people wouldn't know he was drinking a Budweiser. And I, I wondered if there is any kind of a practice like that where you peel the label off of the brown sauce so people don't know you're eating something from London. I don't think I don't think the bottles last long enough for the people to take the uh, peel the label off, you know, because they go through it. But I think if you put a if it was named uh, after the uh, brick nori, it would sell in Lancashire, but it might not uh, it might not do too well down south. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, move on to uh, another question here. And this is actually. Actually, before we move on to the next question, there was something that, that else that I, I wanted to ask you about that, that probably goes along with the bacon buddy. So over over here in North America, we have something that we can buy at the grocery store. It's called an English muffin. What are those called in England? Well, I I, I used to call them like a tea cake. It's, it's sort of a small round uh, bread thing, you know. Um, that's I mean I remember get them as a as a child and my mother used to just buy them at the at the corner store or the bakery and they were little tea cakes uh, and they were uh, they might be something uh, equivalent to uh, uh, an English muffin. But it, it is something that's actually eaten in in England and not something that Americans just make and call English. Uh, do you know when I'm over in England I don't even go we don't even. Uh, well, we don't usually get them because we're we're usually getting the you know the uh, like uh, um, the English muffins or or sorry I should say the tea cakes or uh, or uh, things of that nature. I like the bigger ones because then you get more bacon on them. Like and they call them sort of uh, like a barm cake, and it's it's more like a, a what you might want to refer to as a Kaiser roll over here, where it's a big a big hamburger bun where you can get you know bigger the better, so you get more bacon on it. Okay, I'm just quizzing you because I like adding random uh, English things to the shopping <laughs> list to confuse. <laughs> That's working. <laughs> it's working. All right, so let, let's move on to the next question. Beatles or Rolling Stones? Well, being from uh, being from Lancashire, and uh, I got to go the Beatles because I do remember when I was eight years old, uh, a neighbor uh, came into our house and she said, I'm going to see a band in, in, in Burnley. Uh, and uh, she said, I didn't know the name. She said it, the, a, a group called the Beatles. Uh, and that would be in the early sixties uh, before they, uh, before they make it, made it big, obviously. And they were still playing the local towns. So that's my first experience with the Beatles. But uh, I mean, in 64, when they came out and I was old enough to listen to music, uh, oh, I just I love their uh, early their '64 uh, songs. So yeah, definitely the Beatles. Yeah, I mean, I would say for me, it's definitely the Beatles. That I love both bands, and there's not a right or a wrong answer, but I I do have a story to tell. Okay, so mm -hmm. there uh, uh, once there was the the same college class that I took twice, and I won't get into the details of why I took the same class <laughs> twice. So anyway, I took the same college class twice. I had the, the college class was history of rock and roll. And the final paper was, the question was, which band was better, the Beatles or the Rolling Stones? And he had to write like a five-page paper on it. First time I wrote the Beatles, the second time I wrote the Rolling Stones, and I got an A on both papers. So I mean, I guess there's really not a wrong answer. No, there isn't. And I mean, I like, I mean, obviously, longevity is something with the Stones. And I mean, they've had some really classic songs. And I mean, 
I, but I think the and I, I was a bigger fan of the early Beatles as opposed to their late 60s uh, music, although they did some really good stuff. Uh, I think for Stones, me, for me, the, my favorite song of the Stones is, is Give Me Shelter. And I just think that's a that's a really classic song. And I just I, I never get I never get tired of playing that one, you know. So, no, there's no wrong or right answer. Uh, but then before you ask me about the other one. I didn't even know what Blur was until you mentioned. So that answer to that question would have to be Oasis. <laughs> well, well, like I said, I wrote a uh, a review of uh, the What's the Storyboarding Glory album uh, when I was, I think, a sophomore in high school. Uh, when it came out, I gave it four out of five stars, and that might not have been a high enough review. Blur wasn't even on my radar to review over here in the States. Honestly, when uh, when Tony said, who's Blur? I said, well, you know, when you go to a hockey game and they play that song where they're like, woo-hoo. Oh, he yeah. said, oh, okay. And and that that's what I know of Blur. So, I mean, obviously, uh, Oasis is the answer to me. Going back real quick to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, uh, and you were talking about how you like the the Beatles' early music, which people would maybe say is a bit controversial. I'm going to make a controversial statement because uh, I'm going to say that my favorite Rolling Stones album is one of the least popular albums they ever made. I'm going to say my favorite Rolling Stones album is Her Satanic Majesty's Request. Is that's what I think was the height of the Beatles Rolling Stones rivalry because the Beatles came out with Sgt. Pepper and then the uh, the Rolling Stones said, well, we can make music like that too. They spoofed the album cover. They made this completely psychedelic CD and yeah. it wasn't what people wanted from the Rolling Stones. But if you listen to that album separately on its own, it's some of the best music they ever made. Well, and back in the day, though, in the 60s, uh, you're getting into the mid to late 60s. There was the uh, the, the the groups of, of boys who were mods or rockers. And the mods basically were Beatles supporters and the rockers were more of a, uh, you know, the rock and roll uh, bad boys, which were uh, uh, like the Stones, because the, even the Beatles, they always had the suit and tie on and stuff like that, even though their hair was, well, it wasn't as long at, uh, uh, as as the Stones, but the Stones were always sort of the kind of thought as my my mother liked me, liked the Beatles because she thought they were a little more clean cut and, and she didn't like the Stones because of uh, the way they dressed the long hair. And so she was uh, she was not a Stones fan, was my mother. <laughs> yeah, I think that was kind of the, the image that the, the two bands went for. But, yep. uh, uh You know, at, at the end of the day, e- either way, it's some of the best music ever made. But uh, let, let's move forward because we're, we're uh, probably bogging down here a little yep. bit. Uh, but we, we already know that, uh, that you enjoy poutine, so we'll just skip that one. We already know that you enjoy jalapenos on your pizza, so we'll go ahead and and skip past that one. But what I want to know is whether you watch Coronation Street or East Enders. Uh I, I do. I watch Coronation Street. I tape it every uh, episode, and I watch it. Uh, I watch. Uh, I put it on the PVR, and I watch it every night. So and, uh, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to hide behind it, but I do. I watch it every night. <laughs> well, well, I think that uh, that did I miss any that you wanted to answer, Tony? No. Okay, oh, I, I think you pretty well covered it. All right. Oh, well, then, and my favorite takeaway, I'll say Chinese. Okay, so uh, I I think that that's an excellent segue into the questions that, that Gary sent in. Okay, uh, because uh, one of the questions that Gary sent in is uh, a couple of American soap operas. Uh, he said, "Days of Our Lives" or "General Hospital." Which one of those would you watch, Tony? Uh, neither. I, I have, I did remember seeing when I was a, when I first came over General Hospital, uh, cause there was an actor on there. And, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it was that, that one that Rick Spring, Springfield came from that did the, uh, the Australian actor, the singer that he was in one of those. 
uh, American soap operas. But uh, to be honest with you, I wouldn't watch either one of those. I don't I don't like those. Yeah, I mean, to, to be 100% honest, I never watch soap operas. I could say I've never seen Days of Our Lives even once. I couldn't even tell you what channel it ever came on. I you do. remember, sorry, you remember Rick Springfield, right? Jesse's girl. Yeah. So, well, I, he I, he was in one of those. He, to make ends meet before his music career took off, he was in an American soap opera. Oh, I mean, I I know a lot of people. Uh, you know, kind of got their start there. I, I uh, Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker was a soap opera actor before he got his part in Star Wars. I don't know which one, but uh, I, I didn't know that. What what I was getting to is, so I've never watched soap operas. My only real experience with soap operas was uh, when I was a kid in like the, the late 80s, kind of before cable television became popular. Uh, there was literally three channels. So when, yeah. when soap operas were on, you kind of had to watch them. And I... I know that my mom watched uh, The Young and the Restless. I think that was the only one that she ever regularly watched. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I would watch that when she would have it on. Uh, and then I think after that would come on one that was One Life to Live. And I think sometimes the TV would stay on for that. And then General Hospital would come on next and we would just turn the TV off completely. I don't blame you. I don't blame her. <laughs> yeah, I don't think the, that soap operas are, are quite as big a thing here in the U.S. as they are in uh, England and Australia, from what I'm gathering. Yeah, I never I, I never even considered when I when I was watching Coronation Street that that it was it was a soap opera because it was just to me, it was just sort of uh, I mean, before the storylines got got a bit uh, silly. It was sort of real life, and it was a way when I watched it over here to sort of look back from where I came from. And the street that Cardace Street is is kind of like a street that I initially was uh, lived on in Stanley Street, you know, those kind of houses. So it was a way of uh, of keeping in touch with where you came from. And that is the most that we will ever talk about soap operas on this podcast. End of. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to Gary's next question, which is, uh, I mean, I, I guess maybe a couple of space soap operas, Star Trek or Star Wars? Yeah, I, I was initially going to say Star Trek because that was the first basically scientific, you know, uh, sci-fi show that I ever saw. But as far as uh, the quality and the storylines, uh, I got to go with uh, Star Wars. Okay, yeah, so yeah, Star Wars for me. I I have to agree with you that. Now, to be 100% honest, I don't have anything particularly against Star Trek. It was just one of those things where I put it on and tried to watch a couple times, and it's just like, it's not something that particularly interests me. It's, it's not bad. It just doesn't hook me enough to actually want to keep watching it. Star Wars is something where, I mean, if you listen to the show on a regular basis, you probably already uh, know that I, I make Star Wars yeah. references on a, a pretty regular basis. And uh, uh, honestly, outside of sporting events, Star Wars is probably the, the one thing that I watch regularly that's fictional. Like, I would say probably. Four of the last seven times I've gone to a movie, an actual movie theater was for a Star Wars movie. So, I, I mean, it, it's one of the few things that I follow outside of sports. Uh, well, so, I think, uh, well, Star Trek to me is one that's done well in series on television, uh, whereas Star Wars is something that is better seen in the in the theater, in the cinema. So I, I, you know, I think uh, I just, yeah, it's it, to me, uh, the answer is Star Wars. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those ones like the Beatles or the Rolling Stones where they, they've both been around long enough and, and both stayed part of pop culture long enough that they're, they're really probably isn't a wrong answer. Yep, exactly. And, and I mean, I think that you kind of hit the nail on the head where 
Uh, Star Wars is kind of like the Beatles, where it's less total material, uh, but then there's the quality of the material is higher, where Star Trek has more material, and it's all been consistent with quality. It just never quite reached the peak of Star Wars, per se. Yeah, I mean, Star Trek was developed for, obviously, for television. Uh, and then they made a movie out after that because of, you know, sort of uh, the success. But uh, and Star, Star Wars has always been uh, 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 films. And, and I think that's why it's got that appeal. And the quality is, is, seems to be better on the production and, and, and the storylines and the characters. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I've watched I've watched some of the Star Trek, but you know, I, as far as uh, uh, if I was to sit down and, and watch a film uh, of the two, I'd pick uh, I'd pick Star Trek. How many Star Sorry, I'd pick Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, one interesting fact that, that a lot of people don't know about Star Trek uh, is that it was actually originally developed by Lucille Ball with Desi Arnaz. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. It was, they, they, they were the creators of the original Star Trek series. Well, and, the, and the, one of the things I did like it back in the day is because, obviously, uh, uh, Captain Kirk was uh, is a, uh, a Canadian and born in Montreal, Quebec. So I, I did have a I did I did like him because I did like it because of the fact he uh, one of the stars was Canadian. Well, there you go. So, uh, did you uh, uh, also root for uh, for George Saint Pierre in the, the Ultimate Fighting Championship? I must say, if I've ever watched, uh, and I don't watch a lot of that UFC, but I did watch when he fought. Uh, not only was he, yeah, not only because he was Canadian, but he was he was good, uh, and he was a, a you know a great ambassador for Canada. So, yeah, I uh, I did watch him uh, him fight a few times too. Also, I used to like, uh, and I didn't realize until late, many years afterwards, uh, watching Bonanza, uh, Hugh Green, that was uh, father, uh, the 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 dad on Bonanza, Lord Green, I should say, was uh, was Canadian too. So uh, I uh, I kind of liked that afterwards. But Bonanza was a, was a was obviously an old country western. So it was nice to see a Canadian on that one. And in 1995, you listened to uh, Alanis Morissette all year long. <laughs> yeah, she's from uh, she's from uh, up Ottawa way. Which uh, when I was in that, in the 90s, I I lived only about an hour from uh, Ottawa. So uh, yeah, she got she got a lot of play. Let's go on to the uh, the next one of Gary's questions here. I had uh, he says Jack Daniels or Southern Comfort. Well, I think now I, I've got more of a a, a, a taste for um, the Jack Daniels. I remember when I was eighteen, I got uh, I got drunk on uh, on the Southern Comfort, and uh, I, I pretty well haven't touched it since. So, uh, uh, and I do like a, a nice a nice bourbon uh, once in a while. But so I'd have to say, uh, if I pick one of the two. Um, uh, I go with the Jack Daniels. I like a single malt scotch the best, but I would I would not turn down a Jack Daniels. Well, well, out of these two, I'm going to have to say Southern Comfort uh, only because Jack Daniels is honestly something that I cannot drink. I don't know what it is. I there there has to be something in Jack Daniels that I'm allergic to because it. If I have even like one shot of Jack Daniels, I just get violently ill, and so there, there's just I can't drink it. So, uh, I, but by default, out of these two, I have to pick Southern Comfort. Uh, but I actually prefer Canadian whiskey. Uh, Crown Royal would be my choice, and uh, if I'm going budget, I'd say Seagram Seven. Yeah, you see a lot of that. Uh, you don't get Seagram Seven up here. I think a lot of the uh, the Canadian whiskeys you see down in, in the uh, in the states are sort of uh, 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 distilled for the uh, American audience because Crown Royal obviously is a is a top uh, Canadian rye whiskey, and it's uh, I do have a couple of bottles of that on my bar. I don't drink much of it anymore. I uh, but uh, I yeah, it is Crown Royal. It, it used to come in the uh, in the purple bags, which uh, kids would use for their marbles. That was always uh, 
uh, when you got. Oh, the, it still comes in that bag. Oh, or at least well, here it does. It, it it stopped for a while, so I'm glad they come back with it anyway. But uh, yeah, it was one of those things where you had a bag with a little string on a drawstring on it, and uh, you give it to the kids, and they play put their marbles and some of their toys in it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least the last bottle I bought came in that bag. I they at least in the states they do. I maybe they're they're cutting back, and you know that's the the Canadian exchange rate. You don't get your purple bag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, let's let's move on and say so now this is a question that I I definitely uh, needed to have you here for. Uh, and Gary says here in Lancashire we have a butter pie, which is a traditional savory pie consisting of mainly onions and potatoes. Is this something you would try? One thing that I noticed, and I wanted to ask you this before we got into the answers, is at least in the picture that I saw that it was red onions, is this always made with red onions or any kind of onions, Tony? Well, um, I, you know, a butter pie is not something that we had a lot as a, as a kid. We we had, uh, uh, and it's still popular over there, is a cheese and onion pie, which is kind of a similar, I mean, it was cheese, uh, obviously, uh, uh, boiled cheese, and you, you boil the onions, and then uh, and you put it in, obviously, a shell of pastry, and you bake them. But there was a lot of those, obviously, made up during the war, because there was not a lot of meat, so they had to come up with other, other substitutes for a main course of a meal. And uh, cheese and onion pie is... Uh, I, I certainly would try. I certainly would eat butter pie, uh, there's no doubt. Uh, but uh, uh, as far as my favorite one uh, is a cheese and onion pie. You have that with uh, chips and uh, and some baked beans, and and that's just uh, 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 we have it. We have it at least two or three times, a couple of times a month. So my wife still makes that now, and uh, yeah, I love uh, cheese and onion pie. All right, so so here's my answer. I'm going to answer in part two. So first, the, the reason I ask is because, like Tony mentioned, it, it's not any kind of a meat pie. I do like the idea of red onions as opposed to white onions in it because those tend to be a little bit more flavorful. I'm going to be, go with what you said, Tony. To me, the idea of cheese sounds better than the idea of butter. That being said, I would certainly try it, and it, it certainly doesn't doesn't sound like something I I would uh, have a problem with eating. But uh, yeah, cheese probably sounds butter. So I mean, if you're talking to a cheese, potato, and uh, onion pie, I, I'd definitely be all over that. Oh yeah, uh, uh, really old cheese. Uh, boil down the onions, melt it in with your cheese, put it in a pie shell, uh, bake it, and I'll tell you. Uh, and and the white nice thing with cheese and onion pie, it's just as good the second day because it kind of uh, uh, hardens up a little bit the next day, and uh, you just nuke that up a little bit and warm it up and put some beans on it. Uh, and I'll tell you, it's uh, oh, it, it's uh, it, it, if there were if uh, if there was such a thing as the last meal, that might that would be uh, near the top of my list. <laughs> not that i want to get there to that last meal but <laughs> uh, so now gary writes in the uk some weirdos have pineapple on their pizza is this something you would enjoy color me weirdo because i like hawaiian pizza ham and pineapple so yes i prefer that and i'm in my in our house i'm the minority so we generally when we order pizza i don't usually get often get to order hawaiian but i do like it yes all right, so here's, uh, and this is probably going to surprise some people. I hate Hawaiian pizza, will not eat it, but it's not the pineapple I have a problem with. It's the ham. Oh, okay. I, mean, I, I just, I, I don't like ham. Not only that, like I mentioned before, I don't like full ham. I don't like West Ham. I don't like <laughs> Northampton. I don't like ham sandwiches, and I certainly don't like ham on my pizza. Pineapple is okay, uh, especially, uh, so there, there's something where you can make what's called a, an angry Hawaiian, which is bacon, jalapenos, and pineapple, which is really good. The pepperoni and jalapeno, that's kind of like the official pizza of Arizona. That's kind of like the old standby, because 
everybody likes pepperoni and then he just throw the jalapenos out and it goes perfectly honestly if you want to try the best pizza though is bacon jalapeno and mushroom so i mean if i had to to build like a, a gourmet pizza bacon jalapeno and mushroom i think that we have gotten through all of the food questions and uh so now we have some uh, TV questions that came in. Okay. All right. And you have, uh, so so first, Gary sent in Seinfeld or Roseanne. And, and honestly, I think Seinfeld or Friends is probably a better one because those ones kind of went up against each other. I, you know, Roseanne is kind of a, a different demographic, if you will. I, I've never been a, I was never a Roseanne fan, so... Uh... And I love uh, Seinfeld. I've watched re- re- repeats of that, but uh, uh, definitely uh, Seinfeld. Some of those, the characters in that show, uh, George Costanza and all those guys, uh, Kramer, uh, man, no, uh, you know, I mean, it makes you laugh. Some of the, the scenes when George Costanza comes running out of the toilet with his, with his pants around his ankles yelling, uh, Vandalay Industries, Vandalay Industries, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh no, definitely uh, uh, Seinfeld. I could watch that any day. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think Seinfeld against just about any show is going to win, especially against Roseanne and especially against Friends. I, I would actually probably rather watch Roseanne than Friends. That's how little I think of Friends. But, yeah, this is really an easy one. He also said in, uh, I'm just going to go through these real quick, Cheers or Frasier. Uh, for me, these are both great shows. I probably uh, enjoyed Frasier a little bit more uh, just because I, I, the characters were, were a little bit better. The, uh, uh, I guess, supporting characters, if you will. Family Guy or American Dad. Uh, I'm going to go with Family Guy just because they're both by the same creator. Family Guy is first, and then American Dad is just kind of a rip off of family guy by the same creator so you gotta kind of go family guy uh adam's family or monsters uh these are both shows that i watched uh, a little bit of when i was a kid and uh, i think i like the adam's family better but i i can't say i've watched either one of these shows in at least 25 30 years well i'm I'm, for me um uh cheers is I, i i Cheers or Fraser. I gotta go with Fraser because of the uh the quality of the writing and and the humor in that. I thought that was was uh, a very good uh um you know the just the writing was and the comedy was was really good. So definitely uh Fraser for me. Uh I don't I'm not I've never been a big fan of the American guy or the other one. I don't I, I just I just can't I just I just don't like them. So neither for me on that one, Phil. And uh, and uh, Adam's family and the monsters. I, I I'm gonna go with monsters because I like the actor. I thought Fred uh, Fred Gwynn played uh, Herman Munster, uh, and I later saw him in in uh, in the one uh, uh, My Cousin Vinny, where he was a judge. Uh, he just, I thought he was a great comedic actor, and and so for me, monsters. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I mean, Cheers or Frasier is a really hard one because these are both really, really good shows. And, uh, you know, Frasier, of course, was a spinoff of Cheers. Yeah. Well, uh, he, uh, I mean, it, that character that uh, he played, Frasier, apparently it's the longest running character in uh, in a comedy series in the history of television, I believe, because he, he went from, obviously, from Cheers I took the character over to Seattle for Fraser. So, but I just thought that show was uh, was tremendous. I thought everybody. The only the one criticism I I got a uh, I have on Fraser is that the uh, Daphne was the uh, girl that was in the uh, the maid of the, uh, the the physiotherapist. She was supposed to be from Manchester, and then the whole her family that come over, and not one of them ever had anything to do with the Manchester accent. It was the worst accent ever for an actor. I mean, it was nothing close to Manchester. So that's the only criticism I have about that show is uh, is the characters didn't have the right accent for Manchester. 
Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I've actually looked that up myself and she's from East Sussex. So there's your accent. Yeah. And, and, and I think they had one of the Baldwin boys as a brother. And uh, I'm trying to think of is a well-known actor playing the dad. And he was supposed to be from Manchester. Uh, and he actually talked to, with, with a Southern accent. So, yeah, it was I just thought that they uh, they let themselves down. That's the only criticism I have of that show is they let themselves down with that part of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we've already probably talked over here uh, quite a few times about how uh, mm-hmm. in, in the in the states, at least. I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for Canada, but in the states, at least, we kind of think of England as one homogenous thing. And if you ask the the average American, they wouldn't even be able to tell you that London and Manchester have a different accent. Well, I mean, you've got people from Manchester. Manchester and Accrington probably more have a more similar accent than uh, than obviously the uh, uh, from Liverpool. They've got their own own their own uh, accent altogether. Uh, and then you go on the other coast up uh, Sunderland and uh, and Newcastle, Middlesbrough, uh, the Geordies. They they've got a completely different accent altogether. So it's funny. I mean, in Canada, you can travel a- across Ontario. You can go drive seven eight hours in Ontario. And and everybody's got the same accent. You drive six or seven hours in uh, in England, and you can you're going to come across numerous accents because they're all the the Midlands uh, the uh, of a different accent than uh, than the North. So it's uh, it's funny how that works. But um, uh, definitely they got it wrong on Fraser for that uh, for that uh, Manchester accent. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I think that you you kind of nailed it there, and it. It's something like you said, because uh, yeah, you know, in the U.S. and Canada, you could drive you know, eight hours and everybody has the same accent. It's uh, it's a completely different world, and it's something you, you don't really think about over here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so here's the, the last question that Gary sent in. Is Aerosmith or Red Hot Chili Peppers? Uh, I, well, uh, yeah, Red Hot Chili Peppers for me. I got to go with that one. I like, uh, I do like the, uh, uh, some of their music and, uh, I think they're, yeah, they're more of a, a band that I would enjoy than, uh, than, uh, uh, Aerosmith. Well, I already, uh, I already gave a pretty detailed answer on this one on, on the episode that already came out. So I'm not going to get too deep into this one other than to say that, you know, these are two of the best bands around, even though neither one of them comes from Phoenix. There you go. Well, there you go. That, <laughs> that pretty well covers it. <laughs> well, Tony, this has been a, a lot of fun here today. And uh, thank you to uh, to Gary for taking the time to, to send in all of these excellent questions. And uh, Tony, your your rapid fire has certainly uh, grown to be uh, a little bit bigger than uh, when you just wanted to ask people about mushy peas, hasn't it? Well, yeah, it's it's sort of uh, and we, it's ever evolving, and we you know we we change it up a little bit and and add to it, and uh, I think the uh, the guests enjoy it because they uh, seem to look forward to it, and uh, uh, no, it's uh, it's uh, it's a lot of fun to do, and. Uh, as I say, it's it's nothing serious, but uh, everybody seems to, uh, especially the guests, seem to enjoy it. Well, I sure have enjoyed this chat with you today, Tony. Uh, was there uh, there anything that, that we hadn't gone over, any questions that, that I missed or, or anything like that over the course of our chat today? No, I think uh, I can't think of anything now, Phil. I think we're, we're, uh, we're good, so it's been uh, a lot of fun catching up with you today. It's been a tremendous amount of fun here talking to you today, Tony. And, and like you said, it, it's hard to believe that it's been uh, nine months and 71 episodes uh, since you made your first hosting appearance on the show. And, and I just wanted to, to take a minute to say that it, it goes so far beyond the rapid fire, but you really have uh, allowed us to take the, the show to another level uh, and the level of research that you do on our Accrington Stanley interviews, uh, it's just, it's second to none. And uh, such dedication to Accrington Stanley, and there, there is not a uh, a better supporter in the world that Accrington Stanley could ask to have, uh, and not a better co-host that we could ask to have here on Across the Pitch. 
Well, I appreciate you're too kind, and it's been a, it's been my pleasure. And uh, as I say, uh, uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it, and and uh, and long may it continue. So uh, I appreciate that, Phil. Thank you very much. Well, well, here's to uh, to many more episodes and many more interviews. I and we always finish up with. I'll let you give the first one here, Tony. Okay, on Stanley on. On Stanley on. Mm-hmm.